Hello, my name is Dr. Harriet Hela Kihamba. I am your tutor for OFP 016 Chemistry for Formation program. This course is a two unit course that has 17 topics, and the topics under this course are divided into six knowledge areas. And today we are going to discuss the first knowledge area, and that is fundamental concepts in chemistry. And, and this area is mostly revision from your low level of uh, education, and most of the concepts you must have learned and covered in your previous levels. And under this knowledge area, we have two topics or modules. The first one is basic concepts. This introduces some definitions, notations in chemistry, including the outline of the scientific method, classification of matter and measurement of physical quantities. And the second module is uh, more concepts that deals with some basic uh, calculations that chemistry employ in their field, including atomic mass, molecular weight, percentage composition, combustion analysis, reaction yield, and so on. So after studying this module, the first part, you should be able to describe and outline the scientific method, and you should be able to describe matter and its properties, differentiate between different classes of matter, and also you should be able to describe and apply the international system of units, and identify the main points of the Dalton atomic theory, including its drawbacks that led to the establishment of the model atomic theory. Also, you should be able to describe different types of uh, chemical reactions. Now, to start with, let us recall the definition of chemistry. You, you may uh, remember that science is broadly described as that continuous effort of the human being to systematize knowledge so as to understand and describe nature. Science is subdivided into different disciplines or branches, including chemistry, physics, biology, geology, and many others. So chemistry is that branch of science that deals with the composition, structure, properties, and changes of matter. And uh, describe the laws that govern those changes. Chemistry is not only about equations and formulas and uh, calculations. Chemistry plays a very important role in human life. It deals with all substances in our bodies and around us. And chemistry has very great and important applications in our daily life. For example, chemistry plays a very significant role in production and supply of food. For example, the chemical fertilizers we use, pesticides and preservatives. Chemistry contributes significantly in health and sanitation. For example, the medicines and drugs we use, insecticide and some synthetic vitamins we use. Also, in the area of environmental protection, chemistry is very uh, resourceful. For example, the environmental friendly chemis, chemicals we use, uh, waste management systems, the building materials that we use are all under this uh, branch of science. Also, in transportation communication. For example, the fuels we use, such as for petrol, petroleum products, energy sources, they are all matter and they are described by chemistry. Also in industry, we have some production processes, for example, production of cement, production of glass, production of textile, production of paper, production of paints, and all different kinds of products. They are all 
processes that are governed by chemical laws and procedures. Now, let us start our first part, that is uh, uh, the nature and classification of matter. Everything around us that can be felt with our five senses, for example, we can see them, we can touch them, we can smell them, we can taste them, we can even hear them, that is matter. You may ask yourself that, I can see sound, is sound matter? No, sound is not matter, sound is energy. And you can say that I can hear, or I can, I, I, I can hear, I can see light. Is light matter? No, light is not matter. Light is energy. So the whole universe is actually made up of only two things, that is matter and energy. So matter is anything that occupies space, possess mass, and have uh, the presence of which can be felt by one, or more of our five senses. Classification of matter. As I said that you should be able to classify matter using different ways. Matter can be classified by two main ways. The first one is physical classification of matter and chemical classification of matter. So under the physical classification of matter, matter can be classified as solid, liquid, gas. While under the chemical classification of matter, matter can be classified as pure substance or mixture. While again, under the pure substance, we have two categories. One is elements and another one is compounds. And under the uh, mixtures, a mixture can be homogeneous, homogeneous mixture or heterogeneous mixture. And again, compounds are classified as organic compounds or inorganic compounds. So that is basically the main way we can classify matter. So the, under the physical classification of matter, we say that you have solids, liquids, and gases. Solids have different shapes and volumes regardless of their locations. While liquids occupy a definite volume but assume the shape of the uh, container, only the portion of the container under which it is stored. While gases, they have neighbors, neither shape, no volume. They expand and fill completely whatever the container one puts them in. So the three, you will call that the three states of matter are interconvertible. That is, can be converted from one form to another form. Solids can be converted to liquids, and liquids can be converted to gas. And also, gases can be converted back to liquids and to solids. And there are different chemical ways of converting these three states of matter. Under the chemical classification of matter, we, we say that we have mixtures and we have pure substances. Mixtures contain more than one substance. For example, we have a mixture of gases. We know air is a mixture of gases. For example, in air we have oxygen, we have nitrogen, we have inert gases, and so on and so forth. So air is a mixture of gases. And we say that pure substances contain only one substance. And we say that mixtures can be homogeneous or heterogeneous. So homogeneous mixtures, they are uniform composition. And they have identical properties throughout. We cannot see that this is a layer of oxygen and this is a layer of nitrogen. It's just a homogeneous mixture. While heterogeneous mixtures consist of a number of phases, depending on what are uh, cons uh, consisted in that particular mixture. For example, if you have a mixture of oil and water, you can clearly see this is an uh, oil phase and this is a water phase. While uh, under the pure substances, we have, we say that we have elements and we have compounds. So elements, 
These are pure substances that contain only one kind of particles or atoms. For example, we have carbon element, we have iron element, or iron atoms, or we have uh, nitrogen, and so on and so forth. So elements, they play a very important and central role in chemistry. And we'll discuss this further in the coming uh, lectures. And elements are further divided, subdivided into different classes. We have metals, non-metals, and metalloids. This is a subject of another lecture that we have in the future. But currently, we know that there are more than 110 elements known. Some of these, mostly 90% or more, are occurring in nature, in the earth crust, while others, a few, Others are man-made. They are produced in the laboratory by man. And compounds, these are pure substances that contain more than one kind of element or atoms. For example, we know that water is a compound. Water is a compound of hydrogen and oxygen. It has two atoms of uh, hydrogen and one atom of oxygen. Another example is table salt or sodium chloride. It has only one atom of sodium and one atom of chlorine. So we, we noted that uh, compounds are further subdivided into, into two categories, that is organic compounds and inorganic compounds. And this is a very wide subject, such that in chemistry we have branches, we have inorganic chemistry and we have organic chemistry that are discussing this kind of compounds. We will see that in our coming lectures. So in this uh, topic, you should be able to distinguish between the different classes and properties of matter. For example, you should be able to clearly distinguish between elements and compounds. You should be clearly able to distinguish between uh, homogeneous mixtures and heterogeneous mixtures, you should be able to describe properties that are, are describing physical properties of matter and chemical properties of matter. And also should be able to describe physical changes versus chemical changes of matter. That are other things that you should be able to do. For example, the physical properties of matter. These are properties that can be measured or observed without changing the identity of matter. For example, we can say solubility. That is one of the physical properties of matter. Volume, length, color, order. All these are physical properties of matter. While the chemical properties are those properties that can be observed uh, when changes occur in the identity of the substance. For example, toxicity, oxi oxidation, or uh, heat of combustion, flammability. All these are described as chemical properties of matter. We have noted that a chemical element is composed of atoms of a single unique type that cannot be altered or destroyed by chemical means. They can combine, however, for, uh, to form more than one. Uh, uh, they can be combined to form more complex structures, which we say there are compounds. Now let us move to another uh, subtopic of our module that we say is uh, the atomic theory. The origin of this theory was uh, established by a, a British school teacher by the name of Dalton, John Dalton, who studied the ratios in which elements combine in chemical reactions. And therefore, he formulated the first modern atomic theory. So under this theory, Dalton provides the following postulates. One, that elements are composed of extremely small particles called atoms. And all atoms of a given element are identical. They have the same size, they have the same shape, mass, and chemical properties. 
and also atoms of one element differ from atoms of another element. And uh, this uh, theory also, it is explained that chemical compounds are composed of atoms of more than one element in different combinations of all ratios. A chemical reaction involves only rearrangement or reorganization of atoms. It does not result in creation or destruction of any atom. Those are the five postulates of the atom, atom theory. Now the key points of this uh, theory are that all matter was composed of atoms, which are in, in visible and indestructible building blocks. Also, all compounds were composed of combination of these atoms in defined ratios. And chemical reaction are a result of rearrangement of the reactive atoms. So from this theory, we get uh, the following three laws. The first one is the law of conservation of mass, which says that mass in an isolated system is neither created nor destroyed by chemical reactions or physical transformations. The second law is the law of multiple proportions, that when two elements combine with each other to form a compound, the weight of one element that combine with the fixed weight of another element are in a fixed ratio of small whole numbers. And the third law is the law of definite composition, that a given chemical compound always contains its component elements in a fixed ratio by mass and does not depend on its source or method of preparation. That water will always be H2O, two atoms of hydrogen and one more atom of oxygen, regardless of where that water comes from. And under this atomic theory, uh, it has been uh, revised, revised over the years to incorporate some few are some new discoveries. For example, with the discovery of mass spectrometry, it was established that atoms actually can exist. The same element or the same atom may actually have different masses. So it was discovered that there is existence of a uh, atomic isotopes. For example, hydrogen was discovered to have three isotopes. That is pontium, and deuterium, and tritium. And it was then established further that the interconversion, there is an interconversion of mass and energy. That actually mass can be, be converted into energy or energy into mass. And it was later discovered that Actually, atom was not the smallest particle. It can be divided into subatomic particles, protons, electrons, and neutrons. So those were the new discoveries that came and modified the Datton's atomic theory. So atom no longer is considered as to be indivisible. Atoms of the same element may actually have masses and atoms of different elements may have the same mass. You may have different elements but with the same mass. These are known as isobars. And it was also discovered that ratios in which atoms combine may always not be in simple numbers. So they, they were in simple numbers like one to three. But actually they are compounds with complex combination. For example, sugar. It has 12 carbons atom and 22 atoms of hydrogen and 11 atoms of sugar. So uh, I mean of, of oxygen. So that actually is not simple ratio. And also it was discovered that atoms in the smallest, uh, it is the smallest particle that takes place in a chemical reaction. And it was discovered that Atoms are no longer indestructible. Actually, an atom can be destroyed by, for example, nuclear reaction. 
that were later discoveries that led to the modern atomic theory. Now let us move to the units of measurements. We said that measurements are very significant part of chemistry and also in physics. And measurements are quantitative observation. That a measurement is a number that shows the size of or amount of something, usually in different to some standard. For example, I can say the distance from here to there is two meters. So meter is a unit, and two is a quantity. So a unit of measurement is a standard of reference chosen to measure physical quantity. And it has two parts, the, the numerical part and the unit part. So there exists an international system of units known as the SI system, which comprises of base units and derived units. So the base units, these are basic quantities of which the SI system is based. For example, length can be measured in meters, can be measured in kilometers. There are other uncommon units of length. For example, a yard is also a unit of length. You can say if uh, from here to there is five feet, it's also a unit of length. But the SI system only use meter for measuring length. And for mass, we have a kilogram. For time, seconds. For electric current, ampere, and so on and so forth. So these are called the base units. They are here we have mentioned seven base units. One of the derived units are units that are derived from the base units. For example, area is measured in square meters. So that is meter times meter, length times width, we have a, a, an area. So area is not a, a basic unit, but it's a derived unit. Another example is volume. Volume is measured in cubic meters. But we know that there are other units of, of volume, for example, liters, milliliters, all those are units of volume. And density is mass per unit. Volume, so it is kilogram per meter cubed. These are known as derived units, so they are very significant part of day-to-day -day work of a chemist. So it is important to note that you'll be able to distinguish between base units and derived units. You'll be able to identify SI units for different quantities, and also you'll be able to convert units from one you need to another unit of measurement for a specific quantity. That is one of the things that you should be able to, to use, to do. Now let us move to a second part of this lecture. As I said that this lecture has two parts. The basic concepts and the moral concepts. So let us go now to the moral concepts. The moral concepts. After studying this part, which is module two, or the second topic of this uh, unit. You should be able to define atomic mass, molecular mass, molecular weight, determine mass of a given molecule. You should be able to apply the moral concept to do some calculations, such as percentage composition of elements in a compound. And you also you should be able to a uh, determined percentage composition of a compound from the conversion analysis data. And also you should be able to calculate theoretical and actual yields of chemical reactions. Now let us start with the moral concept. As we said earlier that chemists deal with quantitative as well as qualitative aspects of substances. The qualitative part tries to answer the question, what is it? Well, the quantitative part will answer the question, how much is there? So any measurement has two parts, the numerical magnitude part and the unit part. So the mole is a convenient method of expressing the amount of substance. 
and it is defined as the amount of substance that contains exactly 0 0.6, uh, I mean 6.022 uh, exponent 23 elementary entities of the substance, which is popularly known as the Avogadro number or Avogadro constant. So one mole of a pure, this is compared to one mole of pure carbon, carbon 12 sample, which has a mass of exactly 12 grams. We see that it is, we, we know that it is almost impossible to count atoms and molecules. How, however, we can weigh, we can weigh their substance. So from the mass of a given sample, we can then calculate the number of molecules that it contains. And uh, nowadays, there are modern instruments such as mass spectrometers that can measure the mass of individual atoms or molecules. So in compounds, you have moles, molecules, and atoms. While in elements, you have moles and atoms. Let us now define atomic mass also known as atomic weight. This is the average mass of atoms of an element calculated using the relative abundance of isotopes in a natural occurring element. Most of the time you may not be asked to calculate atomic mass. Most of the time you may just look up atomic masses that are provided in the periodic table of elements and you can use them in calculation, most of the time. So how do we calculate molar mass? Molar mass is the summation of all atomic mass units in the substance. For example, we have a, a molecule of sulfuric acid, which contains two atoms of hydrogen, one atom of sulfur, and four atoms of oxygen. And we already have the atomic masses from the periodic table of elements that hydrogen has one gram, sulfur has 32 grams, and oxygen has 16 grams. So to calculate molar mass of this uh, compound, we will just multiply the atomic masses of each atom to the number of atoms. For example, hydrogen has one, gram and there are two atoms of hydrogen so it is one times two plus sulfur has 32 grams and there's only one atom of sulfur 32 times one plus oxygen has 16 grams and there are four atoms of oxygen so it is 16 times four summing those three we have 94 grams so the molar mass of uh, sulfuric acid is 98 grams Meaning that one mole of sulfuric acid will have 98 grams. So, likewise, if you are asked to calculate the molar mass of two grams, you are two moles of sulfuric acid, you will multiply 98 times two, and so forth and so forth. Let us now move to, to the percentage composition by mass. Percent by mass of individual elements in a compound, a compound, the one that gives us the percentage composition. Let us use the same example of a more a one more of uh, sulfuric acid. We say that it has two hydrogen, one sulfur, and four oxygen. So we, we noted that sulfuric acid is composed of three elements, that is hydrogen, sulfur, and oxygen. So calculating the percentage composition of each element in this one mole of uh, sulfuric acid, we relate this uh, atomic weight or the, the weight of, the, of, of an element to the total mass of the, mole, uh, of the compound. For example, for hydrogen, it is two grams divide by the 98 grams, which is the total mass of the compound, and we, we multiply by 100 to get the percentage, and that is 2.05. Likewise for sulfur, and we do the same for oxygen. And we have to note that the total percentage composition of all 
elements in a subset should add up to 100. So for hydrogen, you have 2.05. Sulfur, it is 32.65%. And oxygen, it is 65.30%. Together, they sum up to 100%. Now let us uh, briefly discuss combustion analysis. This is a method used in chemistry, can be in organic chemistry or in analytical chemistry, to determine the elemental composition of a pure organic compound by combusting. Combusting is burning, it's a, a sample and a condition whereby the resulting products can be quantitatively analyzed. So in performing combustion analysis, a known mass of a sample of a compound is usually containing carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. You can have other elements such as nitrogen, sulfur, and for example, chlorine. It is burnt in a closed container and the mass of the products of combustion are compared to the original total mass. Let us take uh, this example. There are 0 0.487 grams of a sample of, of organic compound whose molecular mass is 3.28, I mean 324 grams per mole. This sample is combusted and found to produce 1.321 grams of carbon dioxide and 0 0.325 grams of water. Now let us do one example of, of uh, determining uh, percentage composition of a uh, compound from its compo uh, combustion analysis data. In this example, a 0 0.487 grams of an organic compound whose molar mass is 324 grams per mole is combusted, that it is burnt and found to produce uh, that much grams of carbon dioxide gas and that much amount of water. And in another example, I experiment the same compound was found to have 0 0.0421 grams of nitrogen. Now from this data, determine its empirical and molecular formulas. Now the first step will be to use the combustion analysis data to determine the percentage of each element in this compound, that is carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen. Now, starting with carbon, we know that the molar mass of carbon dioxide gas is 44 grams. That is 12 grams of carbon and 16 times 2 grams of oxygen. Now, if 44 grams of carbon dioxide contains 12 grams of carbon. How much of carbon will be contained in 1.321 grams of carbon dioxide? And we do the ratio uh, calculation and we find that uh, 1.321 grams of carbon dioxide will have 0 0.36 grams of carbon. Likewise, uh, we express this amount in percentage of carbon of the original sample, which had 0 0.487 grams. Now we find that the 0 0.48 gram sample is the one that was containing 0 0.36 grams of carbon. So 0 0.36 over the total mass that was burnt originally multiplied by 100 will give us the percentage of carbon in that sample, which we find to be 74%. We do the same for hydrogen. And for hydrogen, we use water, because hydrogen is in the H2O. Now, the molar mass of water is 18 grams. We get this from two atoms of hydrogen that will weigh two grams, and 16 grams of oxygen, making a total of 18 grams. That is the molar mass of one molecule of water. Now, if 18 grams of water 
will contain two grams of hydrogen. How much hydrogen will be contained in now 0.325 grams of water? We do the same. We compare this and we get that there will be 0.036 grams of hydrogen. Again, we express this amount as a percentage of the original sample that was burnt, which had 0.487 grams. And we get that the percentage of hydrogen is 7.4%. Now for nitrogen, we were already told from our previous uh, from the information or on the question that uh, there were only 0.0421 grams of nitrogen determined from another experiment that was not explained. Because we know the combustion on analysis will only give us uh, two products, that is carbon dioxide uh, and water. So nitrogen will, was determined in another experiment, which we are not told. Nevertheless, that is the amount of nitrogen in that sample. So we compute it again at the percentage of the sample, which is uh, the same, 0.48, and we get that it is 8.6%. So we have a percentage composition of the three elements out of the four, which was carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen. Now we don't have the percentage of oxygen, but we can use the percentage of the three other elements to determine the percentage of oxygen. Because as we said earlier, the percentage composition should make a total of 100. So because we have 74% of carbon, we have 7.4% of uh, hydrogen, and we have 8.6% of nitrogen. So we can sum this up and subtract them from 100, which should be the total percent of uh, the total mass of the uh, original sample, and we get 10. So this 10 percent now is the percentage composition of oxygen in that sample. Therefore, now we have the percentage composition of all four elements in the sample: carbon dioxide. Hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen. Now, the next step, we use this data to determine the empirical formula of the compound. First of all, we have our four elements. We make a table with our four elements carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen. And we use the atomic weight of each element and the percentage composition of the particular element to make a, a, a ratio. So for carbon we have 74% and we know the atomic weight of carbon is 12 and hydrogen 7.4 and we know the, the atomic mass is 1 likewise nitrogen and oxygen. So we get by dividing the percentage composition by the atomic mass of each element we have 6.2 for carbon 7.4 for hydrogen, 0.62 for nitrogen, and we have 0.62 again for oxygen. The next step, we take the smallest number and we divide by for each one of the four. So for carbon, we get 10. 6.2 over 0.62, which was the smallest. Uh, likewise, we do the same for hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen. So by doing so, we get the empirical form, which is the simplest formula of the compound. That this compound now has 10 atoms of carbon, 12 atoms of hydrogen, one atom of nitrogen, and one atom of oxygen. The last step, we use now the empirical formula together with the uh, molecular mass that was given, which was 324, and we determine the molecular formula of the compound. Now, we remember that the molecular formula is a product of the empirical formula multiplied by a small number or a small ratio n. Now we 
how we use the empirical formula, which is 10 atoms of carbon, 12 atoms of hydrogen, 1 atom of nitrogen, and 1 atom of oxygen. We multiply, and we get that the total mass will be 162. Now, this 162 multiplied by N, we so that we can get the molar mass, which is 324. And therefore, we determine that N is equal to 2. Now, that number N, 2, is multiplied by each uh, number in the respective atom. For example, for carbon, we have 12, 10. We multiply by 2, we get 20. Nitrogen, uh, hydrogen is 12, multiplied by 2, 24. Likewise, nitrogen becomes 2, and oxygen becomes 2. So the molecular formula of the compound is finally determined as 24, uh, 20 atoms of carbon, 24 atoms of uh, hydrogen, 2 nitrogen, and 2 oxygen. So that is uh, how you can use the combustion analysis data to determine percentage composition of a compound. And later on, you determine its empirical formula and its molecular formula. Let us briefly discuss on chemical reactions. We know that chemical reactions happen all around us. And we know chemical reaction can simply be described as interaction of matter and energy to form new products. That is the simple definition of chemical reaction. For example, some of the chemical reactions that take place all around us every day is photosynthesis. That is the reaction of carbon dioxide, water, and light to form uh, sugar, which is food for the plant, and oxygen air. Another example of a very common kind of chemical reaction is combustion. For example, methane ga gas, which is a natural gas, burning in oxygen to produce carbon dioxide, water, and energy. And that energy is in the form of heat, which we usually use for cooking. So when you switch on your uh, gas cooker, that is the reaction that is taking place. That is the natural gas burning to give energy in the form of heat, which you use for cooking. So that, those are a few examples of chemical reactions that take place. So there are several common types of chemical reactions. But in this part, you can simply mention a few combination, or also known as synthesis and composition, decomposition, single replacement, double replacement, Combustion, that are some of the few common types of chemical reactions. So as we said earlier in this uh, topic, you should be able to describe every one of these chemical reactions and give it specific examples of each. I'm not going to go into details about each one of these. You, you can further study them from your uh, modules, but those are some of the chemical reactions that you have to be able to explain and describe. Now, the reaction yield is uh, coming from this concept of chemical reaction. We know that a chemical reaction has two parts. One part is the reactants or reacting substances, and another part is the products. So amount of product that is obtained from a chemical reaction, that is what we say in reaction yield. And normally it is given as weight in grams or weight in number of moles. Now, when we talk about a theoretical yield, if that amount of product that is calculated based on the reagent present by the chemical equation, use the chemical equation, let's take stoichiometry of the equation we clearly show that if this reactant reacts together, they will give this kind of products. And you can use this information to determine the expected yield. However, in real environment, when a chemical reaction is 
really taking place in actual environment, usually the amount obtained will almost never be 100%. There are several factors that are causing the amount of actual yield to be less than that which was expected from the chemical reactions, some of which are unfavorable chemical conditions or, for example, a reaction can be stopped before it was completed and so other, many other factors. But it is almost impossible to have 100% 100% yield. Now, when we talk of uh, percentage yield, is that amount, uh, is that com uh, comparison of the yield that was expected from the chemical reaction equation with that which was actually obtained? For example, let us take this example. We have a, a production of diborane from sodium tetrahydrate, doborate. We have two moles of sodium tetrahydrate reacting with one mole of iodine and producing one mole of diborane and two moles of sodium iodide and one mole of hydrogen gas. Now from this equation, you can see that uh, when you calculate the molar mass of each of one of these products and reactants, you find that the first two reactants have 76 grams, that is the molecular weight of the first reactant. And this one has been multiplied by two because it is two moles that are reacting, plus 254 grams of iodine that is diatomic iodine, I2, giving out 28 grams plus 300 grams plus 2 grams. And when you add both sides, you add the reactant sides and the product side, you find that each one, uh, the, the two, they burn, they have 200, uh, 330 grams. And actually, the essence of balancing chemical equation is the law of conservation of mass. Why? Because mass can neither be created nor destroyed. So usually, we have to balance the two sides, the reactant side and the product side. Now, going back to our question, it was asked that if 152 grams of sodium tetrahydrate were producing, where to produce 44 grams of, of uh, the rain, how much of the percentage that has been produced in this particular reaction? Note that before performing, performing any calculation, you have to make sure that the equation, the chemical equation is balanced. Now let us uh, go back to our masses. We find that the first step now is to determine the theoretical yield. That is what amount was expected to be produced from the chemical equation. And we find that it was 22, I mean 28 grams, because 76 grams of the reactant, the first reactant, remember that there are two reactants in this particular equation but we are dealing with only one, which was involved in our, our question, which is only if 152 grams were producing that particular amount. Now, we say that 76 grams were expected to find how much? 28 grams. Not the more ratio from the equation, that there are two uh, moles of that particular reactant and there is only one more on the side of the products from the balanced chemical equation. Now, if 152 were used, how, many, how, how much was expected? We use the ratio. 76 will give 28. 152 will give how much? If you calculate, 
you find that 152, actually it is two, is four moles of the reactant were expected to produce 56. But now, instead of 56, how much is produced? We are told that is only 44.8. So we find that the products, the actual product, is less than what was expected. We use this uh, information to determine the percentage yield. That is 44.8, which was actually produced over 56 grams, which was expected. Multiply by 100, we get 8. So the percentage yield of this particular reaction is only 80%. That is if this, percent, uh, this particular reaction proceeded to 100%, it would have produced 56 grams. But instead now, it has produced only 44.8%, which is 80%. So you can have this kind of uh, calculations. You may be given one uh, amount of one product to determine what was, would be expected. And now we come to the end of our lecture. You will recall that in this lecture, we recall the definition of chemistry. We outline some of its importance and scope. And also we explain different ways of classifying matter, the physical classification, chemical classification. And also we distinguished the main classes of matter. Next, we discussed about the international system of units. We found out there were two types of units, the base units and the derived units. And we mentioned several uh, units that are used uh, in the SI system. We also discussed the Dalton atomic theory, including its postulates, key points, and the resulting roles, and also its drawbacks that led to the uh, establishment of the modified modern atomic theory. And later, we discussed about the moral concept, and we used this concept to uh, uh, calculate some, uh, to, to, to calculate some of the concepts that chemists use in their day-to-day -day work, including atomic mass, molecular mass, percentage composition, and reaction yield. We also explain a few types of chemical reactions. And that brings us to the end of our lecture. Thank you very much.